What would happen to us and our planet if it became as big as the sun? The diameter of the Earth is 8,000 miles. Crossing it is like driving back and forth across the USA three times. That doesn't sound like much, right? Well, how about repeating this journey 305 more times? Just imagine the gas expenses. This is the diameter of the sun, about 865,000 miles. Compared to our Earth, the sun is unimaginably huge. So what will happen to us if we catch up with it? There are four possible scenarios, depending on what we mean when we say the size of the sun. Scenario 1. The Earth becomes as large as the sun, but its mass remains the same. A colossal planet with the mass of a teeny tiny Earth. First, say bye-bye to gravity. The more massive the planet, the stronger its gravity is, and vice versa. Such a lightweight planet simply wouldn't be able to attract anything to itself. Gravity creates all the heavy substances. Everything, from pebbles to entire continents, is held thanks to it. I believe you've already guessed what would happen without it. We'd all turn into dust particles. Yes, the Earth simply becomes a dust cloud. Oh, and to add fuel to the fire, the gravities of other planets stretch us to the sides, leaving no chance to collect our planet back together again. This scenario doesn't look very good, does it? By the way, even if the Earth somehow remained a planet, life couldn't have originated on it in these conditions. There would have been a considerable distance between the center of the Earth and its surface. And remember, the planet's mass is minimal, so no gravity. It just wouldn't be able to hold the atmosphere. And without the atmosphere, living organisms cannot develop. Not like it would have mattered. The Earth now is a cloud anyway. So now this cloud, weighing about 10 times heavier than Jupiter, is gathering in space. As a result, it collapses and turns into a star. Say hi to the new sun. Scenario 2. This works both as a separate scenario and as a result of the previous one. The Earth becomes as large as the sun and gets its mass. Now we have two suns. We become a so-called binary star system. You know what that means. It's time to destroy our entire solar system. Imagine having two centers of mass in one system. The planet's orbits become unstable, perturbed by such a sudden change. Once they get closer to our X-Earth, they collapse immediately, either from tidal forces or the X-Earth's impact. Yes, even gas giants. Looking at you, Jupiter. Do you know which one survives and finally gets its revenge on us? Pluto. It would probably be the last remaining X planet in the entire system. It's too far away to notice any changes, except for an increase in the mass of the center of the system. So Pluto's orbit comes closer to our two star system, and that's it. The Earth and the Sun would have to accept that Pluto would be their only friend now. The protoplanetary disk that formed our system billions of years ago doesn't exist anymore. So, no more planets can be created in our system. That's all well and good, but what about the Earth itself? What would life be like? Let's see. The nights and days now last longer because of the increase in the Earth's rotation time. There is probably a significant temperature drop in the North and South Poles. Even on our current small planet, they get sunlight scarcely. So, if the Earth's size increased, the area of the poles receiving sunlight would decrease even more. On a positive note, there's a lot more space now. No more overpopulation. The planet's size is so huge that it would take you years to get from one point to another. Yeah, if you think about it, we'd probably be very lonely there. But hey, who knows? Maybe rockets would become our primary means of transportation. Yeah, that would have been cool. There are many vast uncharted areas that no human ever saw or visited. We also wouldn't know about the existence of many different civilizations and tribes. Centuries pass and many of us go away without ever meeting other people or learning about them. 
and that's if we can walk at all. Our bones cannot support our weight with such a considerable gravity, and our hearts have to work twice as hard to keep us alive. The birds can't fly anymore. Nothing can, precisely. All the existing trees fall down, and the new ones grow very close to the earth, like grass. Talking about the trees, how is our ecosystem doing? Well, not good. If we don't appreciate the environment on our small earth right now, imagine what would happen if we had such a massive space at our disposal. I even assume that our tons of garbage would have overpowered even those endless supplies of trees and clean water that we would have in our new large home. Our machines and robots have to be huge to do at least something now. That's because even ordinary farms now are the size of the U.S. states. I also assume that it would be much darker than we're used to. The Earth is so small now. Imagine what would happen when our planet becomes the size of the sun itself. Less sunlight means that we'd probably need an artificial sun. Also, the temperature differences on the planet's surface would be huge. If you're surprised, you probably underestimated the size of the sun. It's almost 110 times larger than the Earth. Our new Earth's equator equals our current Earth's 35 equators. Oh, and remember Pluto? Well, it's our only moon now. The first one would have probably crashed into us a long time ago, making us share the fate of the dinosaurs. In that case, all the water would likely evaporate from our planet. Anyway, there are thousands of bad possibilities, but let's just move on and focus on something good. Scenario 3 Same thing, but the Earth retains its density. Now this one is interesting. We're no longer a planet. We're a star now. In fact, we became even more massive than the Sun. Our planet now has a 3.9 solar mass because we need to balance our low density somehow. In short, it would be almost the same as in Scenario 2, but with more interesting long-term consequences. Since our Earth became four times as massive as the Sun, it would have burned its fuel quicker. Then it would evolve, and depending on the mass of its core, it either becomes a supernova or just blows off its outer layers to form a planetary nebula. If it goes supernova, the sun that was so close to us blasts. And now, there is just our ex-Earth, a lonely ball with a teeny tiny diameter of 12.5 miles. We're a neutron star. That is, a star made of degenerate neutron matter. That thing is ultra dense and spins very quickly, so you'd better stay away from it. If the Earth becomes a nebula, the sun collects all the dust and adds it to its mass. Now we have a slightly more massive sun and a white dwarf. The time passes, and Grandpa Sun lives out his life. It becomes a red giant after depleting the hydrogen in its core. It starts expanding and leaves its material, mostly hydrogen, on the white dwarf. That's us. When the matter reaches high enough temperatures and pressures, nuclear fusion happens. We become a nova. Yay, we're a star again. A lonely one, but a star nevertheless. So what happens next? You see, a star is a battle of opposing forces. One of them is gravity, which tries in every possible way to compress the lead into a small ball as much as possible. The second is a pile of fuel in the star's core, which, while burning, forms tons of energy and substantial hot temperatures. As long as these forces are in balance, the star lives. But when the star's fuel runs out, the star cools down. The pressure inside it drops. This means gravity has won. It squeezes the star with all its might. And as a result, the star goes, hooray! In just 15 seconds, the brightest light you've ever seen in your life flashes. And our ex-Earth goes supernova, leaving a stunning nebula behind. Anyway, don't worry. It's actually impossible for a rocky planet to be the size of the sun. Only other stars can be that large. But wait, why is our Earth so small while the other planets are enormous? Do they just keep growing or do they stop at some point? The more mass you add, 
the more compression you get. As planets become more massive, the gravitational compression increases. They stop growing when their mass reaches roughly 1.7 times that of Jupiter, or 540 masses of the Earth. After that, adding more mass to a planet will make it smaller, because the compression becomes stronger. In other words, our little thought experiment is impossible. So scientists have this idea that some exoplanets, which are worlds outside our solar system, might be water worlds. They orbit their distant stars, covered by global oceans. Even better, some experts claim that our Earth was once the same, a vast expanse of the ocean, and just a bit, if any, visible dry land. At the moment, water makes up 71% of Earth's surface. Our planet experiences continuous movement of water. First, water evaporates, rising from the ocean surface to the atmosphere. Then rains fill lakes, rivers, and underwater reservoirs. Eventually, all this water ends up in the ocean again. Water also plays an extremely important role in the processes happening below the ground. For instance, water content in magma determines how explosive a volcano can be. Anyway, one of the most burning questions about Earth's water is, where did it all come from? It's very unlikely that our planet was simply born this way. The thing is, water has a way lower condensation temperature than some other substances, like silicates or iron. These materials compose the terrestrial planets in the solar system. In the early history of our planetary system, the region where Earth formed was too hot for the oceans to condense at the same time as our planet appeared. So, there's this idea that water appeared on Earth when melted meteorites hit the surface of our planets. Well, scientists disagree. Researchers analyzed some melted meteorites that have been hanging around in space since the formation of the solar system about 4.5 billion years ago. They discovered that those space rocks had extremely low water content. Even more surprising, they were among the driest extraterrestrial materials ever found and examined. In other words, once they melted, there was essentially no water left. These results were very important, since they helped scientists rule out melted meteorites as the primary source of water on Earth. Plus, we can say that this revelation was kind of eye-opening. Imagine the unlikely conditions that aligned to make our planet habitable. Getting water and developing surface oceans on a planet so small and so close to the Sun is a great challenge. If Earth had formed just a tiny bit closer to the Sun, our planet would have been much hotter, and all the water would have most likely evaporated. If it had been farther away from our star, Earth would have turned out to be much colder, and the water would have probably frozen into ice. The team of scientists managed to analyze seven melted meteorites that had crashed into Earth. Those must have splintered from at least five space objects known as plantissimals that later collided to form the planets in our solar system. These plantissimals took part in something known as melting. They got heated up as a result of the decay of radioactive elements in the early solar system. This caused them to separate into layers with a core, mantle, and crust. Plus, the heating and melting of plantissimals apparently led to near-total water loss regardless of how much water they started with. As for meteorites, some of the samples arrive from the inner solar system where our planet is located. The conditions here are relatively warm and dry, so it's no wonder the meteorite samples didn't contain much water. But a few samples were from the colder outer reaches of the solar system. That's from where the water is believed to have come to our planet. But if this water hadn't been delivered by meteorites, what kinds of objects could have carried it all the way across our planetary system? There's one more theory, though, that hydrogen inside our planet played an important role in the formation of the oceans. At the same time, these two ideas are not mutually exclusive. Water could have been delivered to Earth by impacts from some space bodies, like asteroids from the outer edges of the asteroid belt, spanning between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And some amount could also appear inside our planet. There's also a theory that claims that Earth gradually grew by accumulating icy plantissimals about 4.5 billion years ago. At that time, it was still only 60 to 90 percent of its current size. According to this theory, Earth managed to retain a certain amount of water in some form 
throughout the process of accumulating its mass, and as a result of large impact events. It sounds quite plausible. The examination of the chemical composition of lunar samples brought to Earth by the Apollo 15 and 17 missions indicated that water had already been present on our planet before the Moon was formed. So far, all these ideas remain just theories. At the moment, we don't know for sure how water appeared on Earth. What we do know is that there are many other space bodies that have water in this or that state on their surface, or under it. Let's start with our dear Moon. On Earth's natural satellite, water can be found all over the surface, but it's probably not the water you imagine. You won't find pools of liquid water there. On the Moon, it's mostly ice. Some places have more water than others. For example, the poles of the Moon are regions that never get any sunlight. That's why they're extremely cold, and there's a lot of ice there. Plus, the ice in these areas is often mixed with the lunar soil and hidden deep below the surface. Then there's Jupiter's moon Europa. Astronomers consider this world to be one of the most promising places in the solar system to search for new life forms. All because this moon has a huge saltwater ocean with a depth of 40 to 100 miles. Yes, it is hidden under a layer of ice that is estimated to be from 10 to 20 miles thick. But it is still potentially habitable. Astronomers claim that plumes of water erupt from cracks in the ice shell and release the contents of the moon's ocean into space. Of course, the temperature, pressure, and chemistry are far different on Europa. Scientists don't know yet how the ice behaves there. That's why they can't understand how deep or large the water reservoirs on Europa are or how long they need to refreeze. Enceladus is the sixth largest moon of Saturn. It's not really large, only 314 miles across. This makes the space body small enough to fit inside Arizona. Wait, we should try that. Eh, never mind. When the Cassini space probe first arrived at Saturn, Astronomers thought that Enceladus was going to be a frozen ball of ice. But then they saw plumes of icy particles and water vapor erupting from geysers on the Moon's surface. It became clear that there was a massive ocean between the Moon's rocky core and its icy shell. If you've been imagining Mars as an extremely dry place, you need to listen to this. Scientists think there could have been a lot of water on Mars in the past. What makes them think so? They found lots of ancient river valley networks and lake beds on the surface of the red planet. Plus, on Mars, there are minerals and rocks that can only form in liquid water. Mars might even have experienced terrible floods 3.5 billion years ago. These days, there's still some water on the red planet. It's true that Mars's atmosphere is too thin for this water to stay in its liquid form on the surface of the planet. But under the surface, it's a different matter. You can find water in Mars's polar regions, but the only place where this water is visible is at the North Polar Ice Cap. Sometimes, salty water flows down crater walls and hillsides. And there are tiny quantities of water in the planet's atmosphere, but it only exists as vapor. Since we know for sure there is liquid water on Mars, could we possibly use this water during the human-operated mission to the Red Planet? If we manage to do it, spaceships coming from Earth wouldn't have to bring their own water. It would make the cargo way, way lighter, which, in turn, would decrease the cost of the mission. We would just need to take enough water to get to the Red Planet and bring along the equipment needed for filtering Martian water to make it drinkable. Well, it sounds simple enough. So we don't have all the details about how the universe, our solar system, and its planets came to be. But one thing's for sure, Earth didn't just pop out of thin air. Scientists have recently made an intriguing discovery that suggests our planet may have formed way faster than we previously thought. You see, up until now, experts believe it took over 100 million years for Earth to take shape. The common belief was that lucky collisions with water-rich asteroids brought water to our planet. A recent study, however, proposes a whole new perspective. According to these researchers, there's evidence that Earth formed through the rapid accumulation of tiny pebbles, each roughly the size of your fingernail. In this scenario, our awesome planet emerged in only a few million years. And here's the mind-blowing part. They suggest that water being here isn't just some happy accident, but a natural result of the formation process. 
Now, this discovery has implications that go beyond Earth itself. If our planet formed quickly and water was an integral part of the process, it means the chances of finding habitable planets in other solar systems are way higher than we ever imagined. If we stumble upon other planetary systems with planets orbiting sun-like stars at the right distance, there's a good chance we'll find water there too. That's some nice intergalactic real estate that we might just be able to relocate to, should we ever get in trouble here on Earth. The old-school view was that planets slowly took shape through countless collisions over millions of years. According to that theory, water on Earth would have been a random stroke of luck, maybe caused by comets packed with water crashing into the planet during its later stages of formation. The new study introduces an alternative theory too. Picture this, a young sun surrounded by a disk where the planets are popping up. This disk is filled with tiny dust particles. Now here's where it gets exciting. Once a planet reaches a certain size, it acts like a cosmic vacuum cleaner, swiftly hoovering up all the dust in its path. In just a few million years, this tiny planet grows into the size of Earth. This not only shapes our incredible planet, but guarantees water's existence too. As the planet gobbles up the dust, it also snags icy particles floating around in the disk. So, if we use Earth as an example, it suggests that whenever a similar planet forms, it's bound to have water naturally. There's no way for us to travel back in time and see for ourselves, so there are more theories about how planets are born. Let's dive into a different scenario called the core accretion theory. Picture a big cloud of dust twirling around in space. That's where the action begins. Over time, this cloud starts pulling in an astounding 99.8% of all the matter, eventually creating our sun right at the center of our solar system. Soon enough, solar winds join the party, bringing in lighter atoms like hydrogen and helium that are closer to the sun. But those heavier elements? The sun can't pull them in because, well, they're too heavy. So what do they do? They gather together and stick to each other, forming their own little planets. That's how Earth, Mars, Venus, and the gang got together to create round spheres. The heavyweights, like zinc and iron, sank to the middle, forming the core, while the lighter elements meshed on top, creating the crust. But wait, we can't forget about Jupiter. Its gravitational force and the suns were locked in an epic tug of war, perfectly balancing each other out. That's why we have that fascinating asteroid belt hanging out between Mars and Jupiter. Those poor asteroids never got the chance to become fully-fledged planets on their own. This explains why the planets in our solar system are arranged the way they are. The inner ones, known as the terrestrial planets, like Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, are closest to the Sun. They're made of denser stuff like iron, silicon, and aluminum. On the flip side, the gaseous giants like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are chilling on the outer edges of the solar system. These big celestial bodies are composed of lighter materials such as hydrogen, helium, and methane. Now, let's take a trip to the outermost layer of our solar system, where the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud reside. These distant areas are home to ice bodies, space debris, and comets. While there may be plenty of them, they're relatively small and don't contribute much to the total volume of our solar system. The quest to understand planet formation doesn't end here. There's another mind-boggling mystery that's causing a stir among scientists. The existence of a celestial body dubbed the planet that shouldn't exist. Let's rewind a bit. Astronomers have been on a roll with exoplanet discoveries, and we've already spotted over 4,000 of them. Most of these exoplanets resemble the gas giants in our own solar system, like Jupiter and Saturn. Do you know why? It's because those massive exoplanets close to their stars are the easiest to detect. But here's the twist. A new study suggests that there's a whole bunch of Jupiter-like exoplanets just waiting to be found, and they're probably hanging out nearby. This impossible planet goes by the impossible name JG3512b, and it's remarkably similar to Jupiter, only orbiting a tiny red dwarf star. 
This discovery shook things up because it defied the most popular theory of planet formation. According to the prevailing ideas, it should have been impossible for such a giant planet to form around such a small star. So what's the deal with this impossible exoplanet? Well, it turns out that core accretion, the theory we discussed earlier, can't explain its existence. According to this theory, the mass of the debris disk surrounding a young star should be directly proportional to the star's mass. But here we have a star much smaller than our Sun hosting a planet that should be way too massive for it. Something doesn't add up. Either the original debris disk was insanely enormous compared to the star, or core accretion didn't play out as expected in this particular planetary system. We've established that when talking about the Earth's formation, there's still much we don't know. But hey, we've come a long way. Back in the 18th century, a philosopher named Immanuel Kant had his own intriguing theory about planets popping up in the universe. He based his ideas on Newton's law of gravity, but added his own little twist. Kant believed that the universe started with an original substance made up of super-cold, solid particles just chilling out. Then, thanks to gravity, these particles began colliding and heating up. And you know what happens when things collide, right? They get hot. According to Kant, this cosmic twirling and heating up caused some serious forces to come into play. It's like when you spin around so fast that you feel like you're about to take off. These forces led to the formation of rings of matter, like cosmic hula hoops. And as these rings cooled down, they transformed into planets and satellites. Now, not everyone was convinced by Kant's wild idea of planet formation. Critics raised their eyebrows and started questioning the whole theory. They pointed out that Kant failed to address the origin of this primordial matter. Where did it come from in the first place? Moreover, he overlooked the source of energy that propelled these particles from a state of cold stillness to a frenzied cosmic dance-off. As creative as his theory was, it soon faced dismissal in the scientific community. In short, they said, this can't happen. Nevertheless, Kant's theory was still a step forward compared to older beliefs about Earth's origin. Take the ancient Egyptians, for example. They believe that primordial spirits, often depicted with frog heads in their native artwork, were responsible for our planet's existence. Why frogs, you ask? Well, they associated the first substance in the universe with water, and frogs just love humid environments. So, out of that initial water, a primordial hill emerged, followed by the elements of air and moisture. Ribbit. 